Hi everyone, sorry I haven't posted a video in a while, things got a little busy. Um, you may notice this audio recording might be a bit rough, I tried to shoot it in one go as I watched the video, so bear with me. As some of you might know, I recently went on a road trip with my friend Lynn across country, heading through like the southern route from San Diego to South Carolina. It was a great trip, a lot of opportunity for bird watching, nature journaling, a little bit of drunken debauchery, you know, all that fun stuff. I brought two journals on this trip. The first was a relatively small, heavy-duty mixed-media one with really nice paper, which was great because it fit in my purse, but was less great because it was small and it had nice paper, so I was a little bit more hesitant to just do crazy sketches on it and tried to make my paintings a bit more refined. I used this one through San Diego to sketch some of the sea life and into Arizona, as you can see here. Um, once we got into Texas, I kind of ditched it in favor of my larger one for a few reasons, mostly just because it gave me a bit more freedom to be really fast and loose with my sketching. As you can see, I may have decorated it with some of the souvenirs from the South Carolina Revolutionary War sites we went to, and this one was in use for a little while before the trip, so you have to skip through a little bit. I got bored in the airport. You have to use that to get your pencil miles in, you know? So I did use this a bit in San Diego. It was really great for doing just some sketches of like La Jolla and um, some stuff in Oceanside. A lot of seabirds spent a long time trying to figure out how to draw brown pelicans, which are surprisingly complicated. Um, it did get some use in Arizona when I had some time in the hotel to sketch or to sit down and paint rather. Um, and then it didn't get used until Texas and apparently not till South Carolina because I'm seeing a lot of South Carolina birds here. But it got a ton of use in South Carolina, as you can see here. Um, it was really great to have something that I could put watercolor on, but also was thin enough that I could just tear through the pages and fill them up with sketches, not worry about using up like fancy paper. Um, so yeah, this was really great. And once I got home, I started like planning out some of the little paintings I was gonna do um, of stuff I saw, such as these Brant's Cormorants, which will be my first painting. As you can see, I started doing a bunch of thumbnails, trying to figure out what they looked like shape-wise, and then also trying to figure out how the iridescence on their bodies works. I actually ended up asking John Muir Laws, a great naturalist, about how to do this, and he has some great advice on how to do it. Initially, what I was doing was I would paint the birds sort of a greenish-blue color and then try and put some dark spots on there and just leave it like that which, as you can probably see from what I'm doing here, you get a green bird that kind of looks like a cormorant, but not quite, because you don't get that really good dark point that makes it convincing. So, oh well, you live and learn. So aside from John Muir Laws, I decided to look for some inspiration from another great naturalist, Audubon, who's renowned for his birds, and just from studying some of the prints from a book I got in South Carolina, I noticed some really interesting things. If you look at these boat-tailed grackles, they have the same green-blue iridescence on a dark black body that my Brant's cormorants had. And if you look, he really uses it to connotate volume, which is really interesting. You see that green part out in front, and then it kind of fades back, showing the curvature of the bird. He does this on a couple others as well, and forgive me, I am still new to this content creation thing. I'll get at some point. Enjoy the birds. Um, yeah, good job. Okay, here we go. And there's a cormorant. Apparently this one isn't a Brant's cormorant, you can probably tell by the little neck pouch, um, but you can see some really useful uh, technique regarding iridescence here, as he uses that fuller cheek to... Oh, well, that was rude of me. Anyways, Basically, he uses that lighter part of the iridescence and changes the color as the curve changes to show the shape of the bird, which I think is really great. He also has the most amazing dynamic bird poses. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is create a sketch in my sketchbook. This is going to be for sort of a mock-up draft of the painting that I want to do. It kind of helps me figure out the composition, the spacing, and gives me a lot of chances to adjust things before I've committed it to the expense of watercolor paper. It's a really great technique and um, another reason to have a large sketchbook. So once that sketch is done, I go in with some watercolor and it's really useful to be able to test out that composition. And I was kind of afraid of doing this because 
when I was looking at, well, I actually didn't have any pictures from when I was at La Jolla in San Diego. Basically, it's this beautiful stretch of San Diego coastline, and there's beautiful cliffs, there's nesting seabirds everywhere, harbor seals, you know, beautiful blue-green water, kelp, garibaldi, flowers, a lot of bird poop, but, you know, all that great stuff. And it's very sort of light, bright colors, which actually works well contrasting with the, um, the Brands Cormorants, but it was a challenge to make it look realistic. Um, so while that progresses, um, Brant's cormorants are a seabird, they're a diving bird found all along the west coast. They're breeding colonies from Mexico to, um, up in Washington state. There are some that can be found in British Columbia and Alaska, but there are no breeding colonies up there. They mostly eat fish and some crustaceans, so... They're a really neat bird that you'll see almost everywhere on the west coast. I think they're quite common in most coastal areas, but their breeding plumage... Actually, I don't know if their breeding plumage just includes that pouch or if that's a year-round thing, but they're really striking birds, and they're quite fun to watch, especially while they're nesting. As I start to lay in this bright green and blue, you're probably wondering, you know, why that's on a black bird. The whole idea here is I'm blocking in these colors where I want that iridescence to be. I'm using the technique I found from Audubon and paired it with what I talked about with John Muir Laws. So what John Muir Laws basically said was to create that base layer and then build on it by adding these really dark points to it. What I noticed that Audubon did was he really focused on the relation of the light the bird and the viewer's eye. So how that works with iridescence is he finds the iridescence or the iridescence will change depending on the angle of the feather, the light, and the viewer's eye. So with this, the plane that's closest or sort of more directly in front and flat to the viewer's eye is going to appear green. Those that are curved away are going to appear blue on this bird. So I blocked out the areas that are going to help shape the bird by changing that color and, um, yeah. In a moment, I'll go in with some really dark Payne's gray paint and start outlining the darkest points on this bird, which are going to be those outer edges. Because as the light bounces off there, you're going to lose that iridescence at that far point of the curve and in some spots where there's like a little bit more ruffled feathers. Um, or little divots. So I put those in and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over it with a overall wash of Payne's Gray, but those dark points will really stand out and I can lift up some of that wash just to create those areas of iridescence and make them appear even brighter. So while I finish this up, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I transfer this image over onto the nicer paper. So once this painting is done completely dry, I'm going to take a piece of tracing paper and go over this drawing with colored pencil and capture all of the lines I want to transfer to the next painting. Then once I've taped down my watercolor paper, I'll arrange my tracing paper over the top of it, tape down the top, and get a piece of transfer paper or carbon paper and draw over that on the tracing paper to transfer the image in graphite to the watercolor paper. And then I'm going to lift up some of those marks with a soft eraser and go over them again just with a 2 h pencil to put in cleaner lines. Then I can get to painting. Once I've prepared my watercolor paper with my sketch, then I'll start with my first washes. What I like to do is lay down some moisture first. I don't want the page sopping wet, just moist enough where the paint is going to spread evenly. It's really important to kind of do that because it will really help you to get to go where you want to go and to lay nice and flat. One of the things I've struggled with before is overworking watercolor because I want to lay down a nice flat wash and then I'll just go back and keep adding pigment and pushing it around. It doesn't work. It never works. Once it's down, it's down. Leave it. Um, as you can see, I've added some green to the edge of the coastline there to contate like shallower water and then add some darker areas and fade them forward 
to sort of connotate like wind ripples and how that basically shows up as a dark mass farther out offshore and then you can see it as like bigger stripes closer in um the hair dryer is a great tool for you know speeding up the process of drying and then for that background i think i'm gonna do just a sort of uniform wash it's kind of nice to do that if you can put something in the background and then fade it out into areas with like more detail like there's some plants in that area so instead of like trying to do a sharp line I just kind of faded it out to create a lighter area for those leaves and foliage to go same thing over here and just save those crisp lines for really bold edges so you can see I kind of forgot to film that part so got a lot darker all of a sudden basically I just add some more pigments and kind of create a little bit more grainy texture by dropping in some colors there I'm also going to go with the light to dark technique, so I'm putting in all my big splashes of light color first, like you can see on these flowers. Um, it's really easy to add dark in to cover up light. It's really hard to bring light forward unless you're going to play with gouache, which is great, but that wasn't the look I was going for. I figured I'd save that for some splashes of white, but otherwise try and keep it a mostly watercolor painting. One thing that's really important to consider here is which surfaces are wet and which are dry. That's why you'll see me using the hair dryer all the time. I have no patience to wait for things to dry. I want to just keep working. So one of the things that used to mess me up quite a bit with watercolors was I would just keep adding more pigment to different surfaces and then wonder why they'd blend together. So you have to remember that Water has some really amazing properties, which make it great for painting with like surface tension and the way that suspended particles will move from high and low concentration and all that. You create some great gradients and stuff, unless you don't want those things to mix together. So if you want things to mix together like that, great gradient between the green and blue on the coastline, that came out really great with the just wet on wet pigment, but for crisp lines, you really want to control where that paint is being laid down and often laying that sort of control like wet line to outline where you want your pigment to be is really helpful in controlling that. So just be really aware of how wet your paper is, where it's dry, where paint can flow freely, and where it's contained because that's going to help you create really crisp lines that are going to force your paint to stay where you put it. And it is a long and painful process to learn how to do this well, but it's really rewarding. So I suggest a lot of trial and error and also investing in some good paper because good paper is able to absorb water in a way where it just sort of sinks in and sits well, uh, especially like the cotton rag paper. It basically is able to absorb the water and the pigment and it stays where you put it instead of wanting to run. So... Paper really does make a difference with watercolor, as does, well, I mean, the main thing is just controlling what's wet, what's dry, and what pigment you want to blend and what you want to stay. So one technique that I use a lot in this painting is something called glazing. Basically what I'm doing is between layers of paint, I'll make sure they're dry, and then I will basically stack these layers of paint. You can see on the wing of that cormorant in front, um, the body is painted that blue-green, and then once that dried, I was able to go over with the brown bloodstone pigment and create the definition on the wing. And it's really important for this to make sure that you are letting your paper dry out adequately before you add those new layers of pigment so that they don't blend together. Um, it's really useful once you create really precise work. I think that's what I'm going to be doing for... The rest of this, as it's going to be mostly detail work and needs to be more controlled instead of those big washes where you have a bit more freedom to kind of like blend things together and fade it out. Um, but it's a great tool for your nature journal and for scientific illustration in general. So one thing one thing about as I go into this and start building up my darker colors is how contrast is going to play into the composition of this painting. One of the things I've heard is that your highest points of contrast are going to be the places that draw the viewer's eye the most. 
And the way I'm creating volume with these birds is going to be by putting in the dark point along the edges um, of their outlines to create that volume. And that's going to be like the darkest point. I'm going to have that up in the foreground, but I also want to be able to define the cliffs and the coastline a little bit, but I don't want that to feel like it's up in the foreground, so I'm really careful about that. Um, what I'm doing with the feathers here is laying in some really dark, concentrated Payne's Gray. I use Payne's Blue Gray, um, which is really nice because it's a really versatile color and I've used it before in creating like sort of a foggy look for background stuff but it also creates a really nice bold dark black color that still has like some tone to it so it's a very nice cool black um so that's gonna go on there and I'm gonna really punch it in in the areas that I need to be really really dark um it's a great tool um yeah so a lot of definition. Basically, that's going to go on. I want it to be really dry, and I want to make sure I'm using a color that stains. And by staining, I mean something that once it's on the paper, it's not going to lift up when I wash something over it. And the Payne's Gray does that really well. So that first layer is going to go on, and it's going to get like covered with another wash, but those really dark points are going to kind of shine through that as I build things up. And that's kind of a newer technique. I've done things similar to that with um, shadow violet under different colored birds to create that shadow layer as I start to like lay washes over it because that paint will stay fairly well. So now what I'm going to do is start building up that foreground. You can see how some of the shadows on the ground, I use shadow violet for that because it creates a really nice warm shadow up here in the foreground, which is great. Um, it also helps to find that little mound that the one is sitting on. And then when I put that Payne's Gray wash over it, you want to make sure it's a little bit more concentrated than I did. But, you know, once it's on, it's on. You don't want to mess with it too much. You're going to risk, like, disrupting the colors you've laid there before. You can always put another layer on top and just glaze it until it gets the right consistency. Um, what's cool here is with going from dark to light as I lay in that big dark wash you'll see how the plant in the foreground gets outlined by the black on the cormorant. Um, you can go back and reshape things a little bit with the wash if you get too harsh of a line um, cutting in somewhere on those flowers. I don't think I ended up doing that but um, once again it'll time skip because I forgot to film but um, I added some dark little circles on those flowers to give them some definition. I started putting some dark points on the bills, on the coastline, and just building in a bit more depth and detail into this. Um, yeah, at this stage of the painting, I mean, most of the detail is in, the foliage is pretty well established, the big like parts of it are in, and now it's just like all little detail work. So defining those bills is really good. Not good, but like it's it's what you do. Um, as we get into the detail stages of this, it's important to remember that with illustration, you aren't going for, or usually you aren't going for photorealistic stuff. And the temptation to put too much detail in is going to be there. It's always there. And I think the most important thing an illustrator can do is look for places to simplify an image because in that simplification that it makes it easier to sort of intellectually digest and understand what's going on. So avoid the temptation to put every little feather in, especially because that's going to make a really smooth bird start to look kind of hairy and shaggy. Um, and if you kind of make your painting too busy, it's going to start to look off because you're going to notice those details that the artist put in, thinking that they're important, and if they're not something that should draw your eye, then it's just going to create an image that's too busy. And yeah, so avoid the temptation, make really bold strokes in areas that you want attention, and then look for places that you can simplify where you can. And it's hard. It's really hard. But... um yeah, simplify, look where you can cut things out, 
and I think you end up with a much cleaner looking image for it because you're probably going to put in more detail than you need anyways. Speaking of simplification, one thing I want to talk about with this composition is the sky, or rather the lack of it. You may have noticed in that original sketchbook sketch, painting, draft, thing, I did include the sky and some clouds, and when I looked at it again, I decided that it was too distracting. The horizon fell out of place where it just felt kind of confusing, and I realized that the image worked a lot better if it was just land, sea, a very kind of simplified foreground background instead of having like cliffside, land, sea down below, and then like sky. It kind of gave it too many dimensions, especially since I feel like the angle of this is like person looking down at cormorants, looking down at the water, and including the sky in that just made it way too complicated. But not adding the sky gave me a lot more freedom to kind of stretch the sea out further and allowed me to give some distance with like the little bridges and inlets of that coastline. The other thing is looking at ripples on the water. It is so tempting to make really bold lines and ripples and as a sailor I do have an understanding of how wind on water works and I think that for most of my experience with painting water that has been to my disadvantage because I go oh I know what this is supposed to look like and then I kind of over accentuate stuff um but recently we did a class with John Muir Laws it will someday be up on uh his YouTube but it talked about how to paint sea cliffs and waves and water and one of the interesting things about that was really simplifying things and looking at how water looks at a big distance so when you have ripples on water, those little like cat paws that wind makes at a big distance, that's just going to look like a dark patch. And instead of doing all those little cat paws, you're just going to draw that dark shape. And then you can bring that forward into lines, and then eventually those little divots, those little, uh, what are they, trapezoids that the planes of water that get shifted by wind create. And so you can create that... Uh, foreshortening on the water by showing how those like little panes on the water get elongated as you foreshorten. Um, but in this, I think I overcomplicated it and I should have just done a few little lines and left that relatively simple, especially since I did all that detail on the kelp. Um, the kelp I'm happy with, but... I think we could have gone for less detail on like those little wind ripples and waves. So as I wrap up this painting, uh, last steps are kind of adding in the last little dark details and making sure that those sea cliffs in the back kind of fade to a like darker, or not necessarily darker, but more like cool toned. Um, to fade into the background and then as I finish up I take some white gouache which is a great tool if you're not a watercolor purist which I am not and um, go in for the little flecks on the eyes of the cormorants do some little details on the flower and then probably the most fun part was doing the um, waves which I did in two phases one was a diluted white gouache and then I went in with a um, concentrated white gouache right at the little base of the cliffs. Um, it creates a really cool surf effect. Um, yeah, so hopefully some of that was helpful. I really just wanted to get something out and post it online. So thank you for bearing with me and this very, very rough production. Um, there will be more. Next one should be more concise. There will be a print of this there's one available on Redbubble right now. I'm looking into creating prints and setting up an Etsy store where I can sell them directly. Links for everything will be in the description below. Um, definitely check out Redbubble if you're interested in a print right away. Um, come say hi on my Instagram and I will link some of the resources that I use in this down below. Thanks for watching. I hope that you will tune in again soon.